Thank you. <laughs> okay, so I will start first by thanking um, the organizers and Tansio for inviting us. Um, it's a great pleasure. Uh, for me, it's the first time in Sweden. Um, great to meet new people, old friends, uh, be here and discuss most important matters of life and death. Peter is good at that, so, <laughs> so I think we'll have a um, good time together. Um, so uh, we often say that some things uh, can't be dreamt even by philosophers. Uh, and here we are, here we are with COVID um, and new situations, um, deaths, um, terror in some places, uh, lack of medicine, um, lack of doctors and nurses. Uh, we um, are scared for ourselves and for our family and friends. And suddenly, uh, philosophy is no more just a the theoretical thing, but, but very practical. Um, it's good. I mean, then we maybe feel even more needy. Um, but on the other hand, it says something about the world. Um, so our paper is uh, an answer, a kind of answer <clears throat> to um, Tansion's 10th um, chapter of his book. Uh, let me read it. Um, I will read half of it and then Peter will take over. It must be rare for a work of philosophy to be put through stringent testing in the way that Torbjörn Tansio's setting health care priorities was tested by the pandemic that hit us within a few months of the book's publication. One of our aims in the paper is to examine the positions Tansio takes in the light of the pandemic and the decisions that had to be made for setting health care priorities at a time when setting healthcare priorities was in the national and global media spotlight to an unprecedented degree. Observing the priorities of governments and healthcare providers in the extraordinary, extraordinary situation can shed light on the extent to which Tansion's views are part of the thinking of healthcare providers. And if they are not, and the providers did not follow the views that Tansios defense, we can ask, would they have done better to follow them? Chapter 10 of Setting Priorities in Healthcare is entitled Triage in Situations of Mass Casualty. An introduction, Tansios writes, quote, I think of crisis situations where people are dying in a mass. It could happen because of natural disasters, such as an earthquake or a war, or it could be because of a pandemic outbreak of infectious disease. Here, the scarcity is undeniable and there is no way to avoid the problem of allocation when there are no ICU places available for people whose lives could be saved if they were taken care of properly or if we have long ago run out of our supply of ventilators, then we have to face hard choices. Who should be saved?" Unquote. In some parts of the world, the situation Tansios describes is here and now, and we are not talking about imp um, impoverished nations either. Just two days ago, the New York Times published a guest essay headed I'm an ER doctor in Michigan where unvaccinate pe unvaccinated people are filling hospitals bad. The author, Rob Davidson, went on to say, quote, as of last Monday, nine hospitals in Michigan were 100% uh, full and at least 20 others were at or above 90% capacity. Statewide, nearly one in four hospital patients has a confirmed or suspected case of COVID-19. In the last few weeks, my hospital has been constantly at or near capacity and nearly every day, the vast majority of those patients are sick with COVID-19. Nearly all have been unvaccinated." Unquote. Davidson is more precise about the acute critical care patients. 
98% of them, he says, are unvaccinated. As a result, quote, on some shifts, the stress in the air is palpable. My colleagues and I know that patients are piling up, piling up, but there are just not enough nurses to properly triage everyone. A patient experiencing heart failure waits in an emergency room because inpatient rooms upstairs are all occupied. Patients who need surgery can't be transferred because nearly every hospital within a two-hour drive is near or at capacity too." Unquote. Similar situations exist in other parts of the US where vaccination rates are low and in some other countries as well, including Poland. One can and should deplore the fact that insufficient resources were invested in hospital capacity to prepare for the situations that Tansio had um, envisaged. And of course, Tansio was not alone. Public health experts like Mr. Michael Grieger had been warning us for a decade of the likelihood of a pandemic caused by a virus transmitted to us from the animals we raise and kill for food. Now that we are in the situation, however, without having headed these warnings or prepared adequate for what we foretold, what should we do? We shall put aside for the moment the specific question Davidson arises about those who are unvaccinated and instead begin with the more general question. Who should we attempt to save when we cannot attempt to save all? Tansio begins his discussion by assuming that in crisis situations, saving infected physicians and paramedics in preference to others will increase the resources available to benefit others, and so in these circumstances, this is what ought to be done. We agree. He then considers the hard choice of how to allocate ICU beds when there are not enough available for all the people whose life might be saved by them. In his discussion of how utilitarianism approaches the situation, he notes that it holds that, quote, we should allocate medical resources to the patient who can make the best use of them, unquote, and adds that one popular way of assessing this is to use the resources so as to maximize the number of quality adjusted life years, or QLAY, that can be gained from them. This would, other things being equal, mean that younger patients would have preference over older patients, as they can be expected to, to live longer and thus gain more of those years. We agree with this general view and in what follows we'll address some objections to it. But QALYs as they are presently used in assessing the benefits of particular forms of healthcare, focus only on the life of the patient. They do not take into account the benefits that the treatment may have on others, including the patient's family, if any, or on the broader society. Tansi accepts that the fact that a patient has young children is a reason for giving them priority over an otherwise similar patient without children. He also asks if we should consider the impact a particular patient may have on society. As we have already noted, he accepts this idea for healthcare personnel in a pandemic, but thinks that to assess broader social benefits is simply too difficult. Staff admitting people to an ICU in an emergency can look at the patient's age and perhaps some other relevant medical factors, and whether the patient is a parent, but they will not be able to assess social importance and should not be asked to do so. That seems right, for the difficulty lies not only in assessing an individual patient against agreed upon criteria, but in setting the criteria for what it is to have a positive impact on society. Something on which we are likely to get disagreement that goes as deep as the values on which such a judgment must rest. 
Nevertheless, in extreme cases, the situation will be clear enough. For example, if the local maximum security prison calls up and asks if the already full ICU can find room for a recently convicted serial killer, we think the answer should be no, and we believe most people would support the decision. Conversely, in a crisis, we may give priority not only to healthcare workers, but to other essential workers, for example, those who are keeping the electricity network running, or the water safe, and the sewage flowing. What should we do when the ICU does not have the capacity to take all the patients whose chances of survival would be improved by admittance? Tassio notes that Robert Vich, uh, in discussing the utilitarian approach to such situations, argues that while utilitarian thinking may be acceptable in the United Kingdom, it would not be in France and the United States. There, if the allocation of scarce resources is to gain public support, it would need to be incorporate some principle of equity. Tansio indicates that he has some doubts about this claim. He writes, quote, My experience is that most people become utilitarians when they consider a situation of mass casualty, unquote. Thus, the experience of the coronavirus pandemic confirm or falsely or falsify Tansio's observation. We cannot claim to have made a systematic global survey of what happened in the pandemic, but we can make a start by considering what happened in some European countries. So here we go. <clears throat> in March 2020, Northern Italy was the epicenter of the developing global pandemic, we all remember. There were not enough intensive care beds or ventilators for all the patients who needed them. In these circumstances, the Italian Society of Anastasia, Analgesia, Resuscitation and Intensive Care Set up a working group that came up with a radical solution. The traditional first come, first served rule for admittance to the ICU should be replaced with a system of triage designed quite explicitly to maximize the benefits that could be obtained with the limited healthcare resources available. The working group recommended admitting to the ICU those who have the greatest chance of survival and are likely to have the most years of life ahead of them. Not only age, but also the broader health status of the prospective patient is relevant. Patients who are elderly, frail or have other health problems in addition to the virus may occupy an ICU bed for a much longer time than younger and healthier patients. Even if the more vulnerable patients survive, the time they spend on the ventilator may come at the cost of the death of two, three or even more patients who would have been in and out of the ICU during that time. Not only did the working group recommend utilitarian criteria for their admitting patients to the ICU when not all can be admitted, it also recommended moving out of the ICU patients who are not responding well in order to make room for others for whom there is hope of a better response. Of course, this recommendation was to be applied only in a time of extreme shortage of resources and the working group instead uh, insisted that when patients are moved out of the ICU, this must not mean that they are simply abandoned. They must be given palliative care to reduce their suffering. In the same month, March 2020, the Spanish Society of Intensive Medicine, Critical and Coronary Units published a document that is strikingly similar to that of their Italian colleagues. This statement also permitted departing from the usual rules of first come, first served. The Spanish society stated that, quote, in dealing with two similar patients, priority must be given to the person with more years of life adjusted for quality. Give priority to life expectancy with quality, unquote. 
Thus, the statements from the Italian and Spanish organizations of intensive care specialists do not shy away from bold recommendations, nor do they try to hide what they are doing in obscure or ambiguous language. They both demand transparency about um, what is being done in the emergency and why. So far then, we might consider that Tansio's observation has been borne out, at least in its application to medical personnel. In an emergency, they follow utilitarian principles. But the sequel to these initial statements suggests something different. In Italy, the Order of Physicians issued a statement opposing that of the working group of intensive care specialists, stating that, quote, our guide before any document that subordinates ethics to rationing principles and that should in any case be discussed uh, collegially by the profession remains the code of medical ethics. And the code is clear for us all patients are equal and should be treated without discrimination." Unquote. Later in October, the Italian National Committee for Bioethics issued a statement that refers to the fundamental principle of Italian constitution as including a right to protection of health, the principle of equality and the duty of solidarity as well as, quote, the universalistic and egalitarian criterion on which the National Health Service is based, unquote. And then states that the committee, quote, recognizes the clinical criterion as the most appropriate point of reference, unquote, and consider ethically unacceptable any other selection criteria. The committee then lists these unacceptable criteria. The list includes age, sex, social role, ethnicity, disability, cost, and responsibility for behaviors that induced the pathology. So, for example, people are unvaccinated now, right? The committee does not say that it accepts the validity of triage, but it must be based the premise of preparedness that is, advanced planning on the management of emergency situations, and then on the two key concepts of clinical appropriateness and the actual situation. The committee's premise of preparedness is, we noted earlier, good advice for the future. But as it was not headed prior to the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, it could not have been of any assistance when it was released in the midst of the pandemic. The committee's explication of its two key concepts emphasizes the importance, in its view, of avoiding discrimination against people on the basis of previously established categories. Presumably, it has in mind such categories as age or life expectancy. Thus, the only form of triage it accepts as valid, it seems, is triage on the basis of clinical judgment about the usefulness or futility of the treatment. In this case, the ICU bed for the individual patient. The committee acknowledges that its position creates a conflict between the collective public health goal of ensuring the maximum benefit for the greatest number of patients and what it describes as, quote, the ethical principle of ensuring the maximum protection of the individual patients, unquote. This is, it says, quote, a difficult dilemma to resolve when it comes to make concrete choices, unquote, and notes that there is a vast literature on the topic, but it leaves the dilemma unresolved. The committee's report does have a strong dissent from one member, Maurizio Mori, who regards the initial recommendations of the working group of, Italy, of Italian <clears throat> intensive care specialists as pointing in the right direction. Um, we agree with Mori when he describes the majority report of the committee as moved more by the intent to provide reassurance than to address the reality of the need to make hard choices in an exceptional situation. The recommendations of the Spanish Society of Intensive Medicine Critical and Coronary Units were similarly uh, 
This vote by the Spanish Bioethics Committee, which said, Quote, although the adoption of an allocation criterion based on the patient's ability to recover can be justified in a context of scarce resources, in any case, the spread of a utilitarian mentality, or worse still, negative prejudices towards elderly or, or disabled people should be prevented. Unquote. The document also attacks the use of the term social utility, saying that it is, quote, extremely ambiguous and ethically debatable, debatable because every human being, by the mere fact of being so, is socially useful in view of the ontological value of human dignity, unquote. The Spanish Bioethics Committee explicitly rejects the recommendation of the medical society that, quote, any patients with cogn cognitive impairment from dementia or other degenerative diseases would not be on invasive mechanical ventilation. Suggesting that this puts disability-free survival ahead of mere survival and end up discriminating against the disabled, particularly the mentally disabled. And now Peter will go on on human dignity. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Although we recognize, as we have already mentioned, that what counts as socially useful is a contested idea, and taking it into account in admitting patients to an ICU may place an excessive burden on medical personnel, to us, the concept of social utility is far clearer than the concept of, quote, the ontological value of human dignity, end quote. We note that Laura Palazzini, who is a member of the Italian National Bioethics Committee, and in contrast to Maurizio Mori, supported its recommendation, also appeals to the concept of human dignity, which she describes as, quote, the dignity of every human being recognized as person, without making extrinsic distinctions between lives with dignity or without dignity, lives with greater dignity or lesser dignity, based on conditions regarding quality of life, number of years left to live, or productivity. We have searched in vain for some explanation why every member of the species Homo sapien should be regarded as possessing a dignity that members of other species apparently lack. To be more specific, why should an anencephalic human infant born without a cerebral cortex and therefore permanently lacking conscious experiences have greater dignity than Alex, an African grey parrot who could express his own preferences answer questions showing that he possessed the concepts of shape and color, and even, when looking in a mirror, ask, what color? And learn the word gray after being told it only six times. We believe that there is no satisfactory answer to this question. Palazzini talks of, quote, every human being recognized as person, end quote. But should we recognize every human being as a person? In the 17th century, John Locke defined a person as, quote, a thinking, intelligent being that has reason and reflection and, consider, and can consider itself as itself, the same thinking thing in different times and places. As we've just seen, not all members of the species Homo sapiens are capable of this, whereas some non-human animals are. Anencephalic infants are not, in practice, relevant to the allocation of ICU beds in a pandemic. Let us instead consider a severely demented adult, equally unable to function at a comparable level to Alex. The most important difference between the severely demented adult and an anencephalic infant 
is that the adult was capable of having preferences about whether to live or die in conceivable future circumstances, and the infant was not. But this cannot justify a blanket refusal to allow medical specialists to give priority to those with good life prospects rather than those with dementia, including those who would not have wished to go on living in such circumstances. Clearly on this issue, much depends on the degree of cognitive impairment, but many people do not wish to live in a state of severe dementia. To avoid this fate, when dementia is first diagnosed, they take steps to end their lives while they still can, even though this means foregoing some period of life when they are not severely demented and are still enjoying spending time with their families. An example of this is Gillian Bennett, the wife of the philosopher Jonathan Bennett, who some of you here will have read, uh, who wrote about this eloquently in a document you can find online called Death at Noon. She planned her own death while she could still write an eloquent document, precisely because she did not want then to spend years in more severe dementia in a hospice with nurses having to care for her, turn her over and keep her clean while she herself was entirely oblivious to her continued life. It is bad enough that the law does not currently permit people in this situation to give advanced directives permitting someone else to end their life when they are no longer able to do so themselves. The Canadian Parliament, incidentally, is currently discussing this possibility of advanced directives for physician assistance in dying. It would be worse still for a patient with good prospects of living a long and full life to be denied the ICU bed they need to survive COVID-19 because the bed is occupied by a COVID-19 patient with dementia who, when competent, would not have wished to live in such a condition. We should recognize that discrimination in the sense of choosing to give priority to some people rather than others is not always wrong. Criteria for resource allocation should give priority to those people with better life prospects when everything else is equal. To deny this is to follow a rule rigidly without considering its consequences, and that can lead to outcomes that no one wants. In one famous application of such an application, sorry, in one famous example of such an application of the concept of human dignity, in 2006, the German Constitutional Court was asked to decide about a hypothetical situation similar to that which arose in the United States on September 11, 2001, when Al-Qaeda terrorists hijacked four planes. At one point during that day's terrible events, two of those claims, planes had been crashed by the hijackers into the World Trade Center, killing thousands of people and a third into the Pentagon. The fourth was still in the air, and a US Air Force fighter plane was moving into a position where it could consider shooting down that aircraft. That never happened because the passengers on the plane stormed the cockpit, tried to overpower the pilot. The pilot put the plane into a dive, and everyone on board was killed when the plane crashed into a field. But Nobody outside the plane was killed. Now the German Constitutional Court was asked to decide whether in circumstances like that, um, whether in circumstances like that, it would be all right for the German Air Force to shoot down the plane. The court ruled that to shoot down the plane would be a violation of the dignity of innocent people, the passengers on board the plane, and therefore a violation of the first article of the German Basic Law, which states that human dignity is inviolable. The fact that a group of German judges interpreted the concept of human dignity in that way is, in our view, evidence of the fact that the concept is so vague that it gives no guidance at all. Imagine that this incident is occurring during the World Cup, and the, football, and the plane is heading for a football stadium, 
jammed with 80,000 fans, many of whom will die if a plane full of jet fuel crashes into it. Remember, too, that the passengers on the plane certainly have only minutes to live, given that everybody is going to die when the plane crashes. Would it not be right to save the lives of thousands of people in the football stadium at the cost of shortening the lives of the passengers who will otherwise live only for a few terrified minutes? Does not the dignity of the football fans count too? Is the fact that there are so many more of them at risk than the passengers completely irrelevant to determining what is the right thing to do? As utilitarians, instead of making vague, empty, and typically undefended references to human dignity, we prefer to speak of equal consideration for similar interests. This idea was first formulated by Jeremy Bentham and popularized by John Stuart Mill as the dictum, quote, everybody to count for one, nobody for more than one. But it was captured by greatest, with greatest precision by the late 19th century utilitarian Henry Sidgwick, who is the subject, incidentally, of Kasher and my book, The Point of View of the Universe, when he wrote, quote, the good of any one individual is of no more importance from the point of view, if I may say so, of the universe, than the good of any other, unless, that is, there are special grounds for believing that more good is likely to be realized in the one case than in the other. This principle is not only more defensible than appeals to human dignity, it also gives us a much clearer idea of what we should do in order to implement it. In addition to the appeal to human dignity, Palazzini also criticizes utilitarian criteria for the allocation of scarce resources in a pandemic on the grounds that they are, quote, in contrast with fundamental human rights, including the right to the protection of health expressed in international constitutions and regulations, as well as in deontological codes. And incidentally, I'm aware that uh, Dr. Palazzini will be speaking later this afternoon, and I will be interested if she is, wishes to respond to what the criticisms that we're making. Utilitarians support the idea that everyone's health should be protected to the maximum extent compatible with using our resources as effectively as possible to increase well-being for all sentient beings. But again, the idea of a right to the protection of health is vague. And in situations in which it is not possible to protect everyone's health, it gives us little guidance. In our view, such a right should be construed as directing authorities to use the available resources to produce the greatest health benefits. A recent study by Richard Wood et al. shows that using triage is an effective way of doing just that. Wood and his colleagues drew on data from more than 9,000 admissions to UK intensive care units and used computer simulation to compare the effect of triage on the basis of age admitting younger patients and rejecting those above an age cutoff with the traditional, so compared that using that criteria of age with the traditional first come, first served, thank you, rule. Wood and colleagues found that triage had negligible impact on total deaths because those refused admission were, of course, more likely to die, but did lead to more life years saved. Triage at the point of entry to the ICU would have reduced life years lost, they calculated, by 8.1%. Moreover, if more controversially, if, uh, if admitted patients were promptly dis discharged if they subsequently failed to meet the criteria, in other words, if the treatment was not effective or if they're prognosis deteriorated while they were in the ICU, if they were then promptly discharged um, and there were new patients waiting for admission who did meet the criteria and could not otherwise, 
without the patients in the ICU being discharged, could not otherwise be guaranteed admission to the ICU, then the reduction in life years lost rose to nearly 12%. Thus, if there is a right to the protection of health during a pandemic, then even a crude form of age-related triage may do more to guarantee that right than avoiding triage. We hasten to add that we're not in favour of a pure age-related form of triage, although this may, age may usefully be one factor to consider, along with other clinical indications of the likelihood of a good outcome. We note that the British Medical Association appears to share this view, that the state's healthcare system best protects health by using its healthcare resources to the best effect. The BMA's COVID-19 ethical issues, a guidance note, offers the opinion that while it would not be lawful to, sorry, while it would not be lawful to deny a healthy 75 year old access to treatment on the basis of age, quote, older patients with severe respiratory failure secondary to COVID-19 may have a very high chance of dying despite intensive care and consequently have a lower priority for admission to intensive care. The guidance note then says that in the view of the authors, in the circumstances of a serious pandemic, it would be lawful to use capacity to benefit quickly as a criterion for admission, quote, because it would amount to a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim under section 19 of the Equalities Act, namely fulfilling the requirement to use limited National Health Service resources to their best effect. The BMA's guidance note also addresses the issue of removing patients from an ICU when that will reduce their prospects of survival, but makes a bigger difference to the survival prospects of patients who would otherwise not be admitted to an, to an ICU at all. The note asserts that, quote, there is no ethically significant difference between decisions to withhold life-sustaining treatment or to withdraw it, other clinically relevant factors being equal. Although health professionals may find decisions to withdraw treatment more challenging. The authors go on to suggest that, quote, in a setting of overwhelming demand, unquote, it may be necessary to consider the idea of a time-limited trial of therapy, so that if a patient is not responding to the therapy within a specified period, treatment, quote, should be withdrawn and the same facility offered to another patient reasonably believed to have the capacity to benefit quickly. We agree with these recommendations, and they could be taken as confirmation of Vich's suggestion, which Tansio quoted, that utilitarian thinking is more readily accepted in the UK than in some other countries. We note, however, that this is at the level of recommend, sorry, we note, however, that, that this recommendation, that the BMA guidance note, in other words, is uh, a recommendation of a medical association. And at this level, the thinking in Italy and Spain was also along broadly utilitarian lines. And it was only at the level of a national bioethics committee that there was strong opposition to utilitarian thinking. There was no such national statement uh, in the UK to our knowledge. In Germany, one source says, quote, for reasons of justice, all patients who require intensive care treatment should be considered equally in the prioritization, end quote, and adds that it, quote, may touch legal limits, end quote, to withdraw intensive care measures on the grounds that another patient would benefit more from such care. The same document adds, however, that, quote, as there are currently no specific legal regulations in Germany, the decision makers bear the responsibility for these decisions. I'm sure the decision makers would welcome that, but it doesn't give them very much guidance on what to do. 
Given the strength of utilitarian thinking among Swedish philosophers with whom we are familiar, we were surprised to discover that Sweden seems to be among the countries where utilitarian thinking regarding the allocation of scarce resources is explicitly rejected at the national level. The Swedish Council on Medical Ethics are hosts here in the report already mentioned, Ethical Choices in a Pandemic, notes that in 1997, the Reichstag set out the ethical platform for priority setting by the national health system um, and as the platform of the Public Health Agency of Sweden that, quote, takes as its starting point the principle of human dignity and the principle of need and solidarity, which take precedence over the principle of cost effectiveness. The document links human dignity with the idea that people are, quote, of equal worth with the same entitlement to have their rights upheld, uh, adding, uh, quote, end quote, adding that human dignity is, quote, not bound up with the circumstances of the individual, but is afforded to every person, irrespective of their performance, characteristics, or their social or economic status in society. We've already noted the problems with such invocations of human dignity. It seems then that Tansio's observation, quoted earlier that most people become utilitarians when they consider a situation of mass casualty, has not been widely shown to be true of the COVID-19 pandemic. We've already indicated that Veach may be correct to say that it is nearer to the truth in the United Kingdom than in most other countries. But it's also possible that the pandemic, bad as it has been, and still is, is not quite the crisis situation that Tansio had in mind. It could have been much worse. In most countries, in part because of strict lockdowns, which of course have their own costs, it has not completely overwhelmed the healthcare system. Perhaps if the situation were much worse, most people would be prepared to abandon the deontological principles that stand in the way of obtaining the greatest health benefit from the available resources. We come now to a conclusion in which we try to make some practical recommendations. Obviously, we should already be striving to reduce the risk of future pandemics. Ending factory farming, which has already caused several epidemics of variations of avian influenza and the pre previous pandemic, previous to this one, the 2009 swine flu pandemic, would be a great way to do that. And it would have other benefits for tens of billions of animals and for the environment of our entire planet. Assuming, however, that we will not implement such a significant step in the foreseeable future, and we will also not extend our critical care facilities to the point at which they will be able, when the next pandemic arrives, to treat everyone who needs to be treated, how should we allocate our limited healthcare resources? We support the utilitarian goal of minimizing not lives lost, but years of life lost. We would take some account of quality, but only in extreme cases of lack of quality of life. So we would not give an ICU bed to someone with advanced dementia, as we've said, nor to a patient in a persistent vegetative state with no realistic prospect of recovering consciousness. We have no in objection in principle to the use as a tiebreaker of more finely tuned judgments of the quality of life but in practice, moving to quality adjusted life years or some similar set of criteria would put an intolerable burden on the healthcare professionals required to make such decisions. We would, however, give priority to members of needed professions. Healthcare workers is the most obvious example, but we would also include those who are employed to maintain essential infrastructure, such as to keep electricity services running, to make sure that we have safe drinking water or that the sewerage continues to function. Finally, what of the issue with which we began, <coughs> raised by Rob Davidson, the desperately struggling Michigan emergency uh, care physician with unvaccinated patients with COVID-19 
making up 90% of the acute critical care cases in his hospital. Let me read one more passage from the essay in the New York Times just a, a couple of days ago. With every shift, I see the strain people sick with COVID-19 put on my hospital. Their choice to not get vaccinated is not personal. It forces patients with ruptured appendix appendixes and broken bones to wait for hours in my emergency department. It postpones surgeries for countless other people and burns out doctors and nurses." <clears throat> End quote. We agree that, Pace Novak Djokovic, the choice to get vaccinated is not personal. We have long known that it harms others by making it more likely that the virus will spread. And as Davidson points out, it deprives others of access to medical resources that would be adequate if everyone were vaccinated, but are scarce and inadequate in regions where many people refuse to get vaccinated. What can be done? We believe that hospitals such as Davidson's, operating in regions with many unvaccinated people who take up a disproportionate share of healthcare resources, should make public announcements that, after a given date, for example, one month after the date of the announcement, <coughs> people who have chosen not to be vaccinated will receive lower priority than patients who have been vaccinated and have a similar need for an ICU bed. Moreover, this policy should extend to withdrawing treatment facilities from unvaccinated patients when a vaccinated patient has a greater or equal need for the facility. Such a policy is likely to increase vaccination rates, which will be a good thing for everyone. If that happens, such an announcement would benefit the unvaccinated, even if against their will, as well as the vaccinated, and save more lives than are currently being saved. We recognize, however, that such a policy could, at least in the short term, lead to more lives being lost. We hope that will not be the case, of course, and would greatly regret such an outcome. But we would see it as a price that has to be paid to enable people to understand in full the consequences of their choices and thereby in the long run to save more lives. Thank you. Thank you very much. I can take one quick question before you leave, and then I, we, we're going to continue with a comment from Tor Intention. But uh, Kasia, I just wonder what happened in the end in Italy? Which policy did they follow? The, the more kind of utilitarian or the more strict, uh, or the very strict anti utilitarian one? How did so, it catch out in, <coughs> in theory and practice? <coughs> so, in practice, <coughs> sorry. In practice, these are only guidelines, yes? Mm. That, that's the, the thing all over. Uh, the world and uh, and in Europe as well. So it has no uh, practical um, um, outcome um, because uh, doctors in separate ho hospitals need to, to make decisions on their own, right? So um, there is no law behind that, which is a problem in itself, uh, mm. of course. Uh, is there anyone studying uh, what kind of uh, guidelines or that these doctors usually follow or it varies from clinic to clinic or area to area? I think it, um, it varies and it varies um, with the practical situation, yes. I mean, fortunately, uh, with lockdowns and um, some medications and vaccinations uh, all over Europe, the situation is much better now. Um, I can say that in Poland, for example, um, there are no guidelines at all. Uh, so doctors need uh, to follow their own intuition about that. And uh, since uh, they often worry about legal uh, problems, um, then 
they do not want to make hard decisions uh, hmm. and they don't do that. So yeah. it, it simply well, depends on how many beds you still have at different hospitals. Well, that's very, very interesting. Peter, a quick question. Uh, the German Constitutional Court, did they, in their deliberation, they didn't give any weight to the dignity of the people that would be killed if you didn't shoot down a plane, uh, you know, charging against <coughs> a football field or something like that? Uh, no, they did not. Um, they were interpreting uh, Article 1 of the uh, German Constitution, which simply says uh, human dignity is inviolable. It's mentioned um, yeah. and unantaspar. Um, and, uh, and I think they just regarded that as a, a, a deontological statement and saw their job as, as applying that. But also uh, this other people's uh, dignity they, well, is inviolable too. So I, think, I think it, perhaps there was an action omissions distinction going on ah, in their minds. Yep. You, know, oh, yeah. so uh, you have to actually shoot the plane down deliberately yeah. and, and it's an unforeseen, or, I mean, so, sorry, foreseen but unintended side the, effect. Maybe it's the doctrine of double effect. Maybe it's acts and omissions. Uh, I'm not quite sure, but that, that seems, to be, seems to be their focus. Okay. But it's an interesting case, yes, uh, of, of uh, cultural and philosophical differences between uh, Germans and, and British, for example, yes, so Kantian thinking uh, at the constitutional level. And, yeah, well, no, indeed, very interesting. Yeah. So, uh, I'm going to uh, ask Torben to come up. You can uh, uh, go back, but I will call you back then later on for the discussion. If needed, okay. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you very much. It's going to be needed, I'm sure. <laughs>